Welcome to Tech Talk Digital Supply Chain Podcast, where we will help you eliminate the noise and focus on the information and inspiration that you need to transform your business, impact supply chain success, and enable you to replace risky inventory with valuable insights. Join your Tech Talk host, Corinne Bursa, the 2020 Supply Chain Pro to Know of the Year. With more than 25 years of supply chain and technology expertise and the scars to prove it, Corinne has the heart of a teacher and has helped nearly 1,000 customers transform their businesses and tell their success stories. Join the conversation, share your insights, and learn how to harness technology innovations to drive tangible business results. Buckle up, it's time for Tech Talk, powered by Supply Chain Now. Well, welcome back, Supply Chain Movers and Shakers, to the Tech Talk Digital Supply Chain Podcast. I am your host, Corinne Bursa, and I am here to help you replace risky inventory with valuable insights. And today, I am joined by Robert Zwirling. He is the author on this hot, hot, hot topic, that's three hots, of predictive analytics. He's also the co-founder of the Finance Analytics Institute. So Robert and I are going to be talking with you today about agile analytics-driven demand planning, right? More agility, more analytics to get you a better demand plan. So this should be really interesting. So if you're a fan of the show, I want to ask you to subscribe to Tech Talk, that's T-E-K-T-O-K, and leave us a review. And don't forget to follow us on both LinkedIn and Twitter. Now, Here's something that I'm sure that you've thought a lot about over the last two and a half years. And that is how agile or how resilient your business really is. Now, although these two terms are used interchangeably, they do mean different things. Agility is the ability to kind of pivot and change quickly, or at least quicker than you've been able to in the past. Agility is essential to help mitigate disruptions But it's also important because it gives you the ability to exploit some unplanned opportunities that you may see in the marketplace as well. Resiliency, well, it's the ability to avoid or contain or stabilize or recover from a disruption. And we've been doing a lot of that over the last two and a half years. So agility and resiliency for your supply chain today These are not just nice to have. These are critical to your business's ability to thrive. However, Gartner tells us that only 40% of supply chains are set up for resiliency. That's right, four zero, only 40%. And I gotta tell you, I think they're being generous with that number, but that means six out of 10 are structured for one thing. And that structure is for predictability and cost efficiency, not resiliency and certainly not agility. And the bottom line is that makes our businesses fragile, not agile. So clearly we need another approach, which is why I am so glad to have Robert Zwirling with us today. He's gonna share some of his recommendations and insights on this topic of agile analytics and incorporating some artificial intelligence into the way you plan for the future. So the exciting outcomes for you are gonna be that your business is gonna transform. We're gonna see that you can move back into the driver's seat and transform from simply being reactive to what's happening around you, to actually orchestrating where your business is headed and harnessing the latest and greatest demand signals. So Robert, thanks for joining us today on Tech Talk. You are welcome. Thank you for having me here. Well, now, Robert, you have co-authored numerous articles and research papers. You're very prolific on this topic, but you've also got two groundbreaking books, excuse me, groundbreaking books. One is implementing an analytics culture for data-driven decisions. And I know that word culture is very important. We're gonna come back to that. But the other book is AI-enabled analytics 
her business. Now, both of these are published by Wiley, which is very, very well regarded in the marketplace. So congratulations on these two books. But you've also founded the Finance Analytics Institute and the Analytics Academy. So I'm not sure when you're sleeping, but it is safe to say, Robert, that we are going to get some expert insights here today. How did you get into this field of AI-enabled analytics? Well, I, I think I think you can go, could all go all the way back to my college, where uh, I was doing research in two-phase flow for nuclear reactor core recriticality. So that that heady kind of thing was really the application of mathematics and data to do predictions and, 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 and uh, find insights. And that's a very important word, insights. Mm. Um, and I wanna, and I wanna uh, distinguish um, insights from information. Information we get by doing analysis. Analysis is applying arithmetic to data. Add, subtract, multiply, divide. Gee, our sales are up by 10%. That's analysis. It's informative. Yes? Yes. Analytics is applying mathematics on data. So take something like we run a correlation. We find that consumer sentiment is a three-month leading indicator to men's blue shirts in our San Diego uh, department store. That's an insight. An insight is something that we don't know and when known, will affect our decision-making. So with that lead up, how do we get started? It just turned out a number of years ago, I, I, I met a, a gentleman who's become my colleague, my co-author, uh, my, my friend, my collaborator. We've written two book, the, those two books together. We've co-founded the Finance Analytics Institute and we built the, um, we built the Analytics Academy. And it was all about our frustration you know, he's a uh, CFO uh, for a uh, uh, software company um, in uh, Europe. And uh, we were frustrated about how everyone was talking about what analytics is and not how to do analytics. So, okay, I get it. I get what it is. Now, how do I do it? And so we wrote the first book to really help the, um, uh, the, the business analyst, manager, the director in implementation. And the second book we wrote for the directors and vice presidents and officers um, uh, to, to give voice, vision, and clarity to the value of analytics and learn how to implement analytics because two out of three analytics projects are failures. Two out of and, three. Two yes, out of three. All right. We're going to dig into that a little deeper, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And the whole idea is not what you have to do, because we, we I think we pretty well get the what, but now how do we do it? So we, we convert that two out of three failures into 100% success. So that was a whole kind of uh, a journey to, to write the books, found, found the Finance Analytics Institute, develop the Analytics Academy to teach how to, which is the book, the first book is the syllabus for the Analytics Academy. And the second book is for the executives, who, by the way, are the number one problem in, in analytics failures. Sorry, sorry, boys and girls, but it's it's all on you. And, and that's the way it is. And so we did a lot in the second book uh, because everyone is writing about not only the what, but the successes. And we write more about the failures. So people learn the mechanisms of failures, and there are three main mechanisms, which we call um, uh, bandwidth, focus, and budget. Um, but we're not going to get into the book. Uh, the point is that was the journey on how to get here. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that is great um, kind of background, I think, for our discussion. And I love your distinction on mm -hmm. insights um, and really understanding how to apply what we're uncovering uh, in the marketplace and to predict what's happening in the future. So it's no secret, Robert, that I know you said executives are the problem, but right now supply chain leaders, supply chain executives, they're drowning in this environment of uncertainty or increased complexity 
I was on the phone earlier today with a chief supply chain officer, and he must have said the word chaos five times, you know, in the course of our conversation. It's chaos. It's there's too many moving parts. It's too different from the way we've operated in the past. So tell me, why is now the time that we should be looking to leverage um, a more analytics driven process to regain control of what's happening in our global supply chains? Question spot on. Uh, and it really comes back to where we are in our technology. I mean, our technology or transactional systems, our demand planning systems, our ERP systems, our uh, supply chain management systems, our CRM systems, all these systems were built upon a transactional concept and the overall business concept that we had stability in our supply chains and what we were seeking was financial efficiencies, right? Yep, yep. Well, that, that got blown up. That's all out the window. So we have two things, one exacerbating the other. One is transactional systems were never built for the analytics-driven, AI-driven complexities of supply chains that we have today. And our, and our uh, transactional systems were never designed or built for the kind of, as you said, chaos that we have today. And we're not going to be changing these systems. They're too big, they're too expensive. All our processes are built around it. We don't have a chance. We can't, we can't rip out, uh, we can't rip out the engines to the plane while we're up at 36,000 feet. Mm. You know, what we have to do is surround the systems now with user compatible analytics tools that supplement and can provide the kind of uh, predictions and forecasts uh, and uh, scenario planning uh, that's needed to be more flexible and to be more uh, future driven. So let's dig into that for just a minute, right? So can, can artificial intelligence, can, can modern day analytics, um, really use new demand patterns or new demand signals, things that have happened in the last three months or the last four months versus having two or three years of history in order to project future, you know, future performance. Let's talk about that for just, just a minute and how we surround. I like the way that sounds, right? Because we don't have time to do a complete replacement of supply chain planning for every industry. Now that may be necessary you know, for a business over time, but I think the point you're making is we need answers now, right? We need, we need to move product to market today. How do we do that better? So let me back up because I think I've got three or four questions in there for you. So first question, can artificial intelligence use these short-term demand signals to help improve the quality of the demand plan? Yes. Next question. That's a pretty quick yes. yes. <laughs> it is. I mean, because you you have you have long range. Yep. You, can, you can have artificial intelligence for long range and short range and medium range. I mean, there are um, a, there are AI enablements for demand signaling uh, that are using uh, what I'll call uh, what I call more fresh or recent mm -hmm. data to give you a signal yep. uh, in what direction the trends are going. Yes. There's also ways of applying uh, AI and analytics for longer range forecasting. When I do that, I'd say three, six, nine, 12 months. Mm -hmm. right? um, and I won't get into the mechanics of it because we don't have time to, but yes, you can do it and you can get very high accuracy uh, uh, by doing it. So, so Robert, if, if we agree, so historically we always talked uh, in terms, right? So digital supply mm -hmm. chain, we talked in terms of people, process, and technology. Yeah. Today, with, with the data available expanding exponentially, right? data has become kind of this fourth leg of the stool, if you will. So it's, it's critically important, but we don't really have the time to do 
you know, a, a, a huge data cleansing and data warehouse and, and still be able to digest that data quickly in order to be more agile or more responsive. You know, how do we get started? Like, is there a quick way to see some value that we can then get some momentum behind that for the business, right. for, for, the, for the supply chains that we're working in? I wish, Karen, someone would write a paper called Agile Analytics Driven Demand Planning. <laughs> oh, 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 wait a minute, we did that. <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit about that, because Robert, that's how you and I met. Exactly. You and I met because I was doing research for a follow-on book to AI-enabled analytics for business and um, talking to supply chain leaders and thinkers. And we met and then we decided we'd do this paper. And in that paper, we talked exactly about that. You know, how do we, how do we get fast to value? Yep. How do we get going today? And we had, um, you know, I think it was five steps. You know, you know, the, the first step is always define the problem. Always. You, what are we trying to solve? You know, we're not boiling the ocean. What are we trying to solve for? Right? Uh, are we trying to get better um, uh, forecasting for the next quarter, next two quarters, next four quarters? What, what are we doing? And are we doing it at the customer level? Are we doing it at the customer product level? For example. What are we trying to solve for? Because that defines the data. It defines the data, the dimensions, the mathematics. And the second part is choose, you know, your, your what we call the proof of concept software vendor. And as you know, we, this is not an IT function. Do not go there. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You know, this is a user function because the only people that know their business are the users. And I always tell people, I tell people, think of IT as the power company. You know, you, you don't, power company doesn't know your business. They know how to get power to your building and how to keep the lights on. I, your IT knows how to build a network and knows how to build a computing infrastructure and keep it secure and safe. But they don't know what the company does, right? Only you know what your if you're in supply chain, what supply chain does, what you're doing in inventory and what you're doing in logistics. Only you know those things. So those are things that you have to do. You have to select the tool. And unfortunately, you're going to have to fight the battle where IT may come back to you and say, well, you can only use Power BI or Tableau or something like that. And you're going to have to push back on them. Like I said at the beginning, it's the difference between visualization and analytics. Power BI, Tableau, Click, those are visualization tools. Mm -hmm. They're descriptive tools. They're not prescriptive, predictive tools. Go out and find a, um, a, a modern analytic tool. Um, there are many cloud vendors out there for modern analytic tools. And you pick it, match it to your skill set. You know, if you, if you have data scientists, you might get a more sophisticated tool. If you don't have data scientists, you're gonna need a, a more user compatible tool. Yep. But you select it and then you do a proof of concept. And all proof of concepts are small. They should be in that three to six week range. Don't boil the ocean. Now, step three, don't boil the ocean. Um, make it small, but make it measurable. Make it measurable and significant, meaningful. Measurable and meaningful. Because it doesn't have to be large to be meaningful. Yeah. And then after you've done that, you benchmark your skill set. What did we learn? So once we know what we learn and what skills we need in order to run analytics, now we can scale. Now we can go to the next project, the next project, the next project, the next project. And all of them are these you know, small to moderate sized projects because you're going to string along a whole lot of fast to value because that's where you have to be. Agile, flexible, fast to value. We can't wait a year. There's a, there's a wonderful story we have in the book, AI Enabled Analytics for Business, about a company that, that hired 150 people and they got a billion and a half dollar return on their, on their uh, money and they spent $100 million. Now, how many companies can do that? Not a lot. Given, exactly. Not a given lot. that they're, yeah. exactly. There are only five, there are only 20,000 companies that have over 500 people yep. total in their company, let alone hiring 150 of them. 
So uh, that's why I say, even for the largest Fortune 500 company, small is better, fast to value is better, get your return and get those kinds of things that you need to be agile and resilient in your supply chain. So, so you said a couple of things I want to make sure that our, our listeners hear. Um, you buzzed right by using the term predictive and prescriptive analytics, yes. right? So predictive right. in order to project or predict what's going to happen in the future. But right. prescriptive may be a term that they're not familiar with. Yes. And this is the ability to actually prescribe a course of action, right? Based off of the insights that are available, these are the next logical steps or likely steps to take. Talk a little bit about that because that's unique and different and companies that have thought of analytics or been working in analytics in the past are quite honestly, Robert, looking backwards. It's fancy reporting, right? Or it's, it's reporting with drill down capabilities. Here, we're talking about charting the future with additional insights about market performance or business response. So give me just a little more flavor around this prescriptive analytics. The, uh, it, it, starting with hindsight, you know, it, all, all, we're, we're hindsight looking. So what does that mean? It means that we're um, reacting to the future when it, when it arrives versus predicting the future so that we can plan to make the future happen. Planning to make the future happen is prescriptive or proscriptive, right? And because if we can predict, then we want to prescribe, mm -hmm. right? And that's the, that's, that's the notion. And I, I, I do it in the, in the concept of the five key questions that every business has to, has to ask of analytics. What happened? Where it happened? Why it happened? What will happen? and how to make it happen. So when you think about the first two questions, what happened and where it happened, that's descript descriptive analytics. Yep. And that's what we use our reporting and our visualization tools for. When we get into why it happened, predicting what will happen and prescribing what, how to make it happen, that's when we get into our analytics tools. And now we're applying mathematics on data to gain insights to affect our planning and decision-making. Yep, absolutely. Now, another really important thing that you said, I'm taking yes. notes as you yes. are, are uh, laying this down for us. So another important thing is that this is not an IT-driven initiative. Yes. It really needs to come from the business or led by a business leader yes. that understands the business, the context, and the questions that we're trying to solve for here. I think that that's really important. And we have seen over the last four or five years that supply chain roles are taking more ownership of the supply chain master data. And I think that this is a, an important reason around that is because they understand the context of the data and what it indicates into the future. So we can help to you know, train and harness that to really be more responsive or more agile in the marketplace. But Robert, can you give us an example of, um, maybe a business example of a quick win in this area? Because you said we need to look at uh, three to six weeks, that's fast. That is a rapid time to value. So share with us maybe a story from uh, one of your research initiatives or perhaps a company that you've worked with that has been able to gain uh, an important insight or an important capability in such a short period of time. Yeah, uh, exactly. And I'll give you, you know, one, one right out of the box. I mean, a, a $460 million CPG manufacturer. Um, uh, and they had demand forecasting software um, from one of the major uh, suppliers. So, you know, they're not... They're not um, without tools, sure. uh, but you know, again, these systems, um, your average demand planning system has a 35% demand forecast error. Uh, they were running 49% average mm -hmm. demand for, forecast error. 
And they wanted to get that down to 30%. And one of the things they did is they selected a new demand planning system, which was fine. But then they, they had the idea, says, could we, get, could we do better? And so then they followed the five steps that I mentioned before. They said, we want to do better. We want to do it at the customer level. And we want to do it a year in advance. We want to have not just 30, 60, 90 day planning. We want to do 12 month planning, right? We really want to know what we're doing so we can really get control of our supply chain. So they went out, the business organization selected their POC vendor. And I think it was in three or four weeks, they did, um, uh, uh, they did a head-to-head -head comparison uh, of their demand planning, current demand planning system with using AI-enabled analytics, cloud tool. And they were able to get 95% accuracy on average across their tier one customers. Wow, wow. And, and so that's a 5% error over 12 months. So they had 95% average accuracy over 12 months. It was so good, it was too good. And they went back to management with saying, we can't say that. We're gonna say we got an average error of 15%. <laughs> so, so they'll believe us. Uh, that's, I mean, that's remarkable. Uh, in it, all the years is. that I've been in supply chain, I, I have not consistently seen a company do a, a customer level forecast, right? right? So right. item customer um, level granularity, right? So we're not yes. talking law of large numbers here. We are mm -hmm. down in the nitty gritty granularity yeah, of right. the plan. Um, right. But a 95% accuracy rate, yeah. said, honestly, Robert, an 85% yeah. accuracy rate would be impressive. So I can exactly with them backing off from that. It's like, <laughs> let me give you a lower number and then I'll overachieve that number. Right. Uh, so a little sandbagging happening maybe in that particular yeah. example. It, it, it did because we didn't want to, because they didn't want to make it, you know, right. too, un, too unbelievable. Yep. Uh, but, and again, the, the, the numbers range, you know, you could have a, a whole series of ranges from you know 90% to 99%, but you know, you average it out in over a year, and that was that was great results. And they had residual benefits they could do again by continuing to apply the analytics. Not only were they able to reduce their inventory on hand, they were able to do dynamic inventory management. So, in other words, rather than having static min-max levels, they did dynamic min-max levels. And then by having also better forecasting, they also reduced their e &O, and they also could reduce their um, charges, you know, shortage and fill rate fines. Yeah. And so you put that all together and they're at $100 million of, um, of uh, avoided, uh, avoided costs or costs that could be reallocated to growth. So it was tremendous. And it was, you know, you're talking about a three to four week, four week fast value. There's a there's a perfect example of it all under the control of the user group. Yep, and, and so that's substantial to have the ability to use a more accurate forecast to yes. leverage dynamic inventory policies, right? Dynamic yes. safety stock policies for your business mm -hmm. um, really allows you to reduce the working capital. Or where yes. I'm assuming it was a reduction in working capital over time, but it may be that I'm increasing inventory. Um, for higher demand than I expected as well. But the, the bottom line is I've got these new insights that are going to help us make those adjustments right. over time and really get to an optimal performance and make you know, you said a, that working capital. If I, could, if I could be on a word you said optimal, so often when forecasts are done, it's, it's one and done and it's a point. Here's a forecast, which almost never happens. Yep. So you, you wind up spending a lot of time explaining why it didn't happen. In the realm of analytics, we don't do point forecasts. We do forecast ranges, yep. which is a probabilistic range so that business, business can optimize about a, a forecast range rather than a probable range rather than a point number. Yep, I think that's a really important point that you've drawn out. And certainly that's a point that comes out in the article that we've collaborated on. So again, that article is called Agile Analytics-Driven Demand Planning. And you know what? We'll put a link to it in the show notes as well. So it'll 
be easy for our Tech Talk listeners to uh, to download and access that. Because in that, Robert, you've also you you included really a roadmap. This this kind of get started quickly and then scale. I know we've talked through a couple of the key points there uh, to to help our listeners and maybe get them a little interested in in uh, downloading the article as well. But um, I, I love the fact that you and I are such strong believers in having these initiatives being driven by the practitioners or by the business people, um, because I think that they're the ones that get the phone calls, right? Or they're the ones that have to be the problem solvers in the marketplace as well. And, and there are a lot of moving parts. And, and, and in essence, our supply chains are moving at very different rates than they have historically. Um, what When you are working with companies in this area, what, what's standing in their way? What are the big stumbling blocks in really getting a proof of concept? Use the term POC. So anybody listening, um, that stands for proof of concept, POC. You'll hear that term quite often as you are validating business use cases. Um, so Robert, question back to you, you know, what, what's getting in the way? What's stopping uh, supply chain professionals from embracing or doing a proof of concept? Yes. Um, two things is one is their perception of their data. First is we, do, we need real, what they call real time data or big data, or our data isn't clean enough. And uh, I can tell you that it, you, there's, you, got, you have plenty of data. There's no such thing as big data. It's right size data. It's whatever you need for what you're solving. And there's no, and there's no such thing as real time data. It's right time data. Again, whatever you need for what you're solving. If you're, if you're doing demand planning, for example, on, on a weekly, monthly uh, basis, you don't need the data minute by minute or day by day, right? And, and you don't need a mountain of it. So first is to, is, is to stop this self-imposed, oh, we can't do it before it even starts. The second, the second big thing is the battle, uh, battle with IT. You know, they say, well, IT has to do it or IT is forcing uh, uh, the tool on them. You know, like I said, and the tools tend to be your visualization tools. Uh, and they just can't, you know, they're not, again, you can't bring plumbing tools to do carpentry, right? And the idea of bringing, and, and the use, by the way, the users know it. The users understand that these tools are visualization, they're descriptive, they're reporting tools, they're mm -hmm. not analytic tools. So that's the other big battle that has to be fought, which stymies uh, a lot of projects even getting started. Yeah. So yeah, those sure. are the two things. I do think that that focus on the predictive and prescriptive is important. Yes. Um, what, one other reminder is that if your company has the luxury of having a team of data scientists in it, um, you need to be aware that those data scientists enjoy solving a problem for the first time. They don't necessarily enjoy doing that over and over, right? They want to be creative and exploratory in how they are evaluating a bunch of different business use cases. So we need a way that we can um, institutionalize and get repetitive um, and momentum under our way that we've proven it works. We expand maybe the, um, the customer list or the products or the market or the channel. And then we get broader and broader in the way that we're improving our overall demand plan. So I think it's a great use case in using um, agile analytics, but artificial intelligence or AI, which is just a fancy way of saying, you know, new math and new methods to solving these business challenges. Um, I, I think it's exciting. I, I really think, you know, it's a great time to be in supply chain. And it's um, amazing to see the use of new science. Um, helping to not just solve the same old problems, but address um, new data, incorporate new opportunities, and refine the process 
uh, so that we can indeed be more resilient or more agile in the way our businesses respond. Um, Robert, as you as you think about this, you know, I want to first of all thank you for the opportunity to collaborate with you on the article. It's it's been a lot of fun and a great opportunity to get to know you. But if you could leave our audience with one final thought, what would that be on this topic of, of using agile demand um, analytics to really drive better decisions faster? Right, I guess the best way to say it is uh, the Nike slogan, do it, right? And, and, and you do it, don't wait, yeah. right? Um, if you have to run a covert operation, run a covert operation. But um, by the way, my research um, that brought us together shows that people are doing it from the from you know companies, whether they're a hundred million dollars or uh, the top fifty Fortune five hundred companies, they're all doing it. You know, people are engaged in surrounding their transactional systems with these kind of anal agile analytical thoughts mm -hmm. and how to bring it to the table and how to solve local, uh, you know, the local problems uh, with uh, user enabled tools that are that are analytic tools that they can bring and they'll learn them and they'll find them and they'll do them and they are. And so uh, the, the best thing to do is do it. The best time to get started is now. And uh, it's it's uh, like I say, it's low cost, it's fast to value, it's high ROI. So uh, do it. Sounds pretty compelling. And that's it for today for our Tech Talk Digital Supply Chain audience. Listen, I want to thank you, Robert Zwerling, for joining me today and helping to inspire all the supply chain movers and shakers out there. Let's make sure uh, to check out the article that Robert and I collaborated on. It is called Agile Analytics Driven Demand Planning. And I think you'll really want this um, not only to inform your current initiatives, but it's going to give you a few ideas for the future as well. So Robert, what is the best way for our Tech Talk listeners to connect with you? First of all, thank you for having me here. It's been a great pleasure to be on this uh, webcast. Great pleasure to work together. Look forward to doing more of it. And uh, it's easy to get a hold of me on LinkedIn at Robert J. Zwirling. And I'm there and you can say hello and uh, we can then connect via email real fast. All right. Terrific. Well, until next time, remember that this show would not be possible without all of the supply chain movers and shakers in the marketplace and the fans of Tech Talk Digital Supply Chain Podcast. Please follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter and be sure to give us a comment or two on your feedback on today's topic. Our goal at Tech Talk is to help you eliminate the noise. Focus in on the information and a little inspiration to help you transform your business and replace risky inventory with valuable insights. We'll see you next time on Tech Talk, which is powered by Supply Chain Now. Thank you.